Welcome to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. And on this episode, we are going to discuss the incredibly popular Netflix series Squid Game, which is basically going to be us just kind of BSing about it for a little bit. Uh, we're really interested in sort of the impact this show has had. Um, and you might ask yourself, you know, why are we even talking about this? We sort of limited ourselves talking about television or uh, movies in the past. Uh, but this is so popular that we felt like we couldn't ignore it, that we had to just talk about the themes and some critiques that we have related to the series. Um, if you've never heard of Squid Game, it is a Netflix program from South Korea that was the most popular Netflix show in over 90 countries, which at the time was news to me that Netflix was even in over 90 countries. I was shocked, but good for them, I guess. And it's the most popular Netflix series ever viewership wise. Over a hundred million of their subscribers have tuned into Squid Game, which is over half of all their subscribers, which was shocking to me. Also, A, that that many people watch Squid Game, B, that Netflix had that many subscribers. Um, and just for reference, the record was previously held by the Netflix series Bridgerton. Uh, 80 million households tuned in to watch that. So 100 million for Squid Game, 80 million for uh, Bridgerton. God, we should do an episode uh, thing on Bridgerton, but that's a whole different story. Um, if you've never seen it, I guess, just spoiler alert, there's going to be spoilers throughout, uh, obviously. So if you want to remain uh, in the dark about what happens, then you should uh, tune off now and come back after you've watched it. Um, so let's go just over the basic premise. So if you haven't seen it and you don't want to watch it, you're going to at least know what we're talking about. Um, Let's make it simple, I guess. A group of poor and indebted people, uh, men and women both, are recruited to play a game that is a series of life and death children's games. Um, the games themselves are not life and death, right? It's like tug of war and red light, green light, but they're designed so if you lose, you die. Um, the last one standing wins 45 billion won, which is uh, right now about $83 million. So if you survive past everyone else, you win $83 million. The whole thing is organized by a few ultra wealthy men, basically for their entertainment. They're so rich that they became so bored that they created Squid Game, the whole concept, so that they could watch these people living in poverty basically fight to the death. So it's purely there for their uh, entertainment. Anything to add yet? No. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty good synopsis. Uh, like a, like Nick was saying, we're not going to go into a lot of depth and detail. There's not going to be like secrets revealed. Obviously, every channel on YouTube or podcast has probably already talked about this. We're a little bit late to the game, but mm -hmm. we're late to the game because we don't have necessarily the same aims or goals of those other channels or pods. Our goal is to kind of look at like the effect or perceived effect of um, the series as a whole um, and to draw into critical inquiry like the fact that like these uh, anti-hegemonic pop culture phenomena rarely have any profound effect regardless of their reach and I think that's our main criticism of this. Moreover, we also want to explore the ideas as to even of all of these millions upon millions upon millions of viewers, how many are actually kind of, to be blunt, getting it? Mm -hmm. um, do they get it? Even though it's so overt and the directors made it overt, um, I mean, do they even understand what they're watching or is this just more mindless violence entertainment? Um, yeah. So, I mean, we, we've kind of I mean, reached yeah, the we're age really of interested in, Yeah. Yeah. Exploring like why this series and why now, like this is an astounding level of popularity. Why, you know, why is it so popular? And like Jared said, is it really having the impact that I guess we feel it should be having. I don't know. Um, I mean, okay, is it so even, it, yeah, I mean, is it even good at having that impact, I guess, is my, my critique. Yeah. And, and I was wildly entertained. I like the show. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But like, I, I just, I don't know that it's going to hit home for a lot of, of its viewers, even though they're probably vaguely aware of its social um, or economic or political critiques. I guess I, I guess what I'm wondering I mean, is just to be blunt, if you haven't seen it, matter. it's it doesn't it's even matter. Purely anti-capitalist. It's yeah. a narrative on capitalism and the atrocities that result from the capitalist system, and that's not just us reading into it and like pulling something out. Like the writer and director has specifically said that that was his main 
theme throughout writing and directing the series is that it is a critique of capitalism. It is anti-capitalist at its core. Um, so this is not just us, like, oh, of course, these guys think it's an, a narrative on capitalism. Like, it is. There's no ignoring it. We're not making it up. It is overtly anti-capitalist, like, through and through, you know? Yeah, let's get moving. So, you know, I, I it's interesting to me that, like, when I think of all the reasons that it could be so popular, like you said, it is violent. And I think that that obviously plays into its popularity, but that reveals, I think, maybe something interesting about all of us globally right now, for some reason, why are we so into the violence? And if you haven't seen it, it's not just like, oh man, there was a fight. It's like literally people being executed point blank. Like that's basically the entire show. Um, and just like copious amounts of blood and death and murder and like throat slit and like players falling to their death and skulls exploding and like organs being harvested. And I mean, I, it just violent, it's violent as you can possibly imagine. Um, why is the really interesting question for me? Because, you know, I, if you told me that, you know, this incredibly violent series was going to be the most watched show in the world, I wouldn't have believed it, but clearly that's the case. So I don't know. What do you think? So from the the director, producer, writer's point of view, the violence is emblematic of the real world violence of capitalism. Capitalism is, um, in, in our humble opinion, um, probably the most violent uh, ideology that has ever uh, existed. I mean, it's definitely up there with some of the great world religions and perhaps nationalism, but ideologically speaking, capitalism knows no other way to achieve its ultimate goals uh, aside from violence. Um, at least that's the way it's been played out. Historically speaking, there might be some sort of utopian, pure uh, Adam Smith version that he wrote about, but in real world application, you have transatlantic slave trades, you have uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of indigenous people, you have debt culture, right? Like like capitalism is, you have back-to-back -back world wars that had uh, uh, major cues, major major parts of them that were capitalist ventures, right? Like, so so it is violent. So I think that's that it's intentionally violent uh, metaphorically speaking. Do you in think terms we're of numb why, to it at this point? Why, what's that? Do you think we're numb to it at this point? Well, I'm talking about real world examples. Now, what I was going to transition to is why do we want to view that in our pop culture um, mm -hmm. mediums, whether it's through gaming or film? Um, or what few of us, I guess, still read books, which unfortunately is probably not me anymore either. I'm, I'm part of the problem. But um, but why we want to partake in violence, that's another question. And I think, yes, it's, it's partially because we're numb to it, but I think it is the, um, the safe way to engage with these feelings of frustration that we all have and most of us are not prepared to be violent ourselves, which is a good thing. That's part of the, go back and listen to our episodes on the actual parts of human nature, I'd argue we're not violent. Um, but this is a, like I said, it's a low key way for us to engage with those feelings and maybe release some of those urges that we may or may not have. And again, whether it's through watching it through film or getting out through gaming culture, um, that's something that I think is, is kind of a safe release for us. I think that's one of the reasons that, that we've become a little bit more numb to violence anyway. I mean, and the fact that it's like a global phenomenon is really interesting because it's not just like, you know, that Americans are just numb to violence. And so they will accept the series because, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's across the globe at this point. I think people are willing to accept a higher level of violence in their media that probably wasn't the case in the past, right? Um, yeah, so I just think there's a lot there regarding violence and the popularity of the show that for whatever reason right now in global society definitely contributes to the show's popularity, I think, in interesting and maybe like grotesque ways, you know. What about the anti-capitalist aspect, right? Because definitely it's not as if this is the first you know, pop culture item that has had anti-capitalist themes, right? Like we could run down a list from like, you know, sorry to bother you, the recent, somewhat recent Boots Riley film, which was really good. You know, They Live for sure in the, when was that? 70s, or early 80s. 
I think it was the 88. Matrix. Yeah. When was it? Yeah. Uh, they what live else? with like 88. I mean, you've got the okay. platform. Um, oh, yeah. El Hoyo. Yeah, we did an episode on the platform yeah. for sure. Starship Troopers. Um, yeah. Casa yeah, del Papel, I mean, Money Heist recently on Netflix also. That's actually a one I didn't think of comparing these two. It is a the pretty, Spanish that was series. a pretty big phenomenon, mostly in Europe. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Not nearly as popular as Squid Game, but really popular. Right. American um, Psycho would be a big one. Oh, yeah. That's um, a good one. Office Space. It was funny. And then, of course, if yeah. we want to just stick to like the, 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 the content where we're drawing this content from Parasite. I mean, that's winning awards. Mm-hmm. I still, I guess it's just not hitting the same notes as, as Squid Game for some reason. And I think that's what we want to explore. Well, I think Parasite's kind of, you know, apples to oranges in a sense because it was a film not distributed on Netflix, right? It was actually in theaters. I mm. mean, it won an Oscar for best film, so we can't knock it for not being successful, but it's not the phenomenon that Squid Game is, right? For sure, right. I think. Which well, is God bless America. That was that was on Netflix forever. I think that, I think mm-hmm. they just recently removed it, but that one was, I mean, you can't get much more um, on the nose in its critique, um, not just of capitalism, but of everything Americana. Um, and it is equally as violent as Squid Game, if maybe not more so. Um, mm-hmm. And I, now, that, now that I'm thinking of God Bless America, let's go all the way back to Natural Born Killers. Um, mm-hmm. uh, what was that? 90, 91, 92, 93, Woody Harrelson. And I forget, uh, is Ju- Ju- Juliet Lewis. Is that right? Anyway. Um, I guess what, like we're saying, what was the German about, series? This was like an indie film. It wasn't popular, but not series. The film, The Educators. Yeah, right? that Whatever was a good one. The Educators is, but... was a good one. Um, the Wave was another good one. Um, that was also a German film. Um, also, mm-hmm. I think a, a Norwegian film about an actual wave, but we're talking about the German one regarding like political ideology. Well, and like Avatar, right? Is like the big critique and commentary on like colonialism, right? And, but this is all leading us to our question of... You know, all of these really good artworks are just blatantly anti-capitalist and Squid Game is just the latest in a long series of, you know, this one is probably the most popular, uh, one of the most overt, you know, anti-capitalist film or series. Are people really, is that really resonating with people? What do you think? No. I mean, I'd like to think it is. I'd like to think we've reached a point um, due to, of course, um, reaching um, peak failure of capitalism, um, revealing itself via, uh, what are we at? About, yeah, I think we're actually in almost two years, two years of pandemic life um, globally. I'd like to think that that, peop- that, that that the actual message is hitting home. And maybe it is for a couple of people, but but I don't think. I don't think all of the viewership is 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 really getting the message here. Um, I don't think they really got the message with some of the other uh, popular films we talked about. I mean, and even if they are getting the message, what is anyone actually going to do about it? And I think, right? Like uh, yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. Is like there's a few different possibilities, right? No one's getting the message. Just, they just aren't seeing it somehow. And it's not even just People, the film itself that, that that delivers the message because, like, again, you just Google Squid Game and everybody's talking mm-hmm. about it. Every podcast is talking about it. We're not going to be unique here. We're not setting ourselves apart. Uh, every YouTube channel is talking about it. Every publication, screen rant, whatever, they're all talking about it. And they're all – it's on the nose. Like, everyone's saying, this is a critique of capitalism. And yet, I still don't think it, it matters, I guess yeah. is what I'm saying. Like, cool. Like, it's critiquing capitalism. It's on the nose do the viewers know or care and even if they know like and care what are they willing to do to change their behavior and engagement with the system to make any sort of change yeah i think there's a few possibilities right either you watched it and you just don't get it at all like the message completely lost on you you watched it and you get it but you disagree with it, right? Like you're entertained, but you're just so pro-capitalist that like you're willing to watch this entertainment, but you completely just disregard the message whatsoever. You watch it and you get it, but you're unwilling to do anything about it. It just doesn't matter. You get like, okay, I get this is anti-capitalist, neat, you know, full stop. But what am I going to do? What's on Netflix yeah. next? Yeah. Right. Or you watch it and you get it and like you're willing to do something about it, right? I think that, like you said, the latter category is probably very, very slim. But the possibility is that like we need to consider is that 
the capitalist system is so hegemonic that it doesn't even matter if media is produced that can be globally popular, that directly confronts and critiques it, it does not matter. There's nothing that anyone can do about it, right? That it is so all-encompassing that it can also just fold in Squid Game and be completely unfazed. And I think that, you know, like we said, this is a long line of anti-capitalist media from all kinds of different, in all kinds of different forms. And it doesn't matter. Capitalism is still going, you know, full bore. Uh, there's just no, no kind of art. I guess we shouldn't expect art to motivate people, you know, out of the cave, so to speak. It's just not a thing, I guess, which is depressing. But I think that's just how it is. Well, what you bring up then is an interesting um, question. And we'll probably switch gears for just a second and go into like what we actually study and research in real life. We, uh, we know nothing, obviously, about film. Uh, so we're a little outside of our comfort zone here. But we do obviously study ideology, revolution. This is what we work on. Revolutionary theory dictates, and st- specifically what I'm calling out here is structuralism, is that the material conditions, right, and the macro meta conditions need to be just so for change to actually occur. And none of this, and I would argue art falls under the umbrella of volunteerism, um, none of that matters until those structural conditions are right. Is that what we're insinuating a little bit? So we can produce these anti-capitalist or anti-nationalist or anti-military like military industrial complex films until we're, until we're blue in the face and none of that's going to matter until the structural conditions are just so. What do you? Is that where we're going with this? Because there's been numerous critiques. Since film has existed, it has been a wonderful way to critique. And mm-hmm. uh, very rarely has it led to actual change. In, in, in whatever it's critiquing. I mean, very clearly the film didn't result in any one individual's material conditions being worse, right? I watched it on Netflix in the comfort of my living room and then went about my daily life. I was no right. worse for wear for watching the series. So why would I you know, be like, wow, that was really good. And like the capitalist, anti-capitalist message really hit home for me. I'm going to go, you know, work at my local food bank or something like that's just as sad as it is, that's the not realistic connection. I think that anyone is going to make, you know what I mean? And so then we're left with this idea that like anti-capitalist art forms, just, a, I don't want to say they're a waste of time, but like, do they really have any impact whatsoever? I don't know. It comes back to this idea again, now getting more into the academic side of this in terms of revolution, like this is awareness building, but does awareness building ever, when do we just get stuck in a cycle of awareness building and Mm -hmm. never to actual calls to action? There's no call to action. Part of this is that it's so on the nose that like, I don't have to think about it at all. It does all the thinking for me. Like it's planting in my brain, this anti-capitalist, like I'm being bombarded with that from the show Like, I don't have to read between the lines. I don't have to interpret it in certain ways, right? Like, it's just all there. I don't have to do any work on my own. So I'm not as likely to be moved by that theme in the series, you know? I can't speak to the global audience. I I watch a lot more foreign film Mm -hmm. and TV, and not just because I'm trying to be some sort of snobby, fancy person. I just think it's – I do genuinely think it's better. Um, Mm -hmm. So I don't know that the message is really even all that lost on a global audience. My, my fear, and this sounds, you know, mean, it's mean of me to say this, but I think the meaning would be most lost here um, in Western Europe and the United States. I just, um, and maybe even more than Western Europe, perhaps just specifically the United States. I just think a society that has proven over and over again, most profoundly in the last two years of pandemic, that is willing to suspend its understanding of reality for its own individual selfish notions of of me. I just, I, I don't think, if there was ever an audience that didn't get it, it's here. Let me be blunt. I mean, or you uh, could just have like, you could imagine, right? Like the most, how you could take the most sort of perverse interpretation of the series and be like, yeah, this is, I love this. It's my goal in life to be one of like the game makers. I want to be that rich. You know what I mean? Like that's possible. Like, and but that's like the American psycho kind of phenomenon, right? Mm-hmm. Like that gruesome. And in that, it's a cult classic for a reason. Like it's not a cult classic because it's a satire. It's a cult classic because many people might want to act on those impulses that, that are right. revealed in this film. Um, mm-hmm. 
I mean, shoot, there are two really popular ones that hit home even with like children, right? The Hunger Games is one of the easiest examples. No one gets the Hunger Games here. Mm -hmm. I think people on a global level get the Hunger Games, but I don't think they get the Hunger Games here. Mm -hmm. The capital is us. We are the capital, right? Right. Um, just like we were talking about before we, we went on the air here, Wally, like produced by arguably the biggest media giant in the world, right? Uh, Pixar underneath Disney, right? Basically is a critique of everything we are and where we're headed on this current trajectory. Literally Disney giving us the finger as we're watching mm -hmm. this and, and, and what are we going to do? We are the slobs. We're the slobs being moved around in our like chair, drinking our, our Slurpees or whatever they're drinking, their shakes. Um, no sort of autonomy, no critical thought, um, no engagement with anything beyond what the screen directly in front of our face. Um, I mean, Wally is really telling people straight to their face that you're a piece of shit. And all people take away from it is like oh, cute little robots, you know, like. Right. And it's a just cautionary left. tale. Yeah. I'm just left, like, I guess, defeated in the fact that, like, like you said, Disney's the biggest media company in the world and Netflix and like all of these like massively successful things that critique the status quo. And it just falls on deaf ears. Like, it doesn't matter. We're just out for entertainment. We actually don't want to think about the meaning at all. Right. And so that gets us to the, the other question regarding capitalism in general when we were picking on a Disney or a Netflix is they don't care if it's critiquing the system that they thrive in or support because they know they're going to it itself. They, they've reached the point where they can actually sell this and make money on the critique itself and mm -hmm. thus become even more powerful in this case. Yeah, right. I mean, what the critique the, itself what can be commodified. By, right? by one of the people in Netflix, we, we are not a, a organization that speaks truth to power because they edited out certain parts of, of documentaries. Yeah, the Patriot um, Act. That came yep. out even this week. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what they're about. So they're willing on in, in, in one way, talking out of one side of their mouth, yeah, here it is. This is an anti-capitalist uh, series out of South Korea, and we are going to dump millions upon millions of dollars of it. Or there's the one out of Spain, um, Casa de Papel, we'll dump millions and millions. We'll even buy the rights to that one because it was, I think, it wasn't even Netflix originally, mm -hmm. but they bought it so they could keep making seasons of it. Um, the Platform would be another good example, even though that's not a show, that's a film. They're willing to engage in this because there's money to be made in the critique. Do you think it has an impact for the Western audience, let's just say specifically the United States, that it's an international film. So they can specifically even actually, now that I think about it, Korean. So they just write it off, right? Like, yes, of course, of course the Koreans are critiquing capitalism, right? Like, of course they are. That's what they do. They critique the American lifestyle. It's not real. Like, that's just how the, you know, that's how they view us and it's just outrageous and wrong. Like, that's what the American would think, right? Well, but I mean, anyone that knows even a little bit about history knows that the the parasitic version of capitalism that exists in South Korea is only there because of the Marshall Plan, um, mm -hmm. post World War II, right? And yeah, but, but I mean, I guess that. like a hundred million households watched Parasite. Like a hundred of them know what the Marshall Plan is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose you're probably right. Um, anyway, okay. <laughs> so yes, they can blow it off. So they can blow off. Yeah, uh, whatever. But but then I go back to the other examples that we rattle off. Literally, mm -hmm. it's called American Psycho. Literally, it's called God Bless America. Even if we look at the other critiques, right? Like if we even go to a different genre, rather than anti-capitalist critique, let's go anti-military industrialist critique, right? Like, like everyone at this point is at least aware of the existence of things like Apocalypse Now or Platoon or whatever. And yet the, the, there's no, there's, there, there's no struggle in recruiting. Why? Is it because we think that we're powerless? So like I said, even if we're like, oh man, I get the meaning, but like, what can I do? Or is it because the meaning is lost on us? Which one is it? I think it's both. I think it's equally both. I think there's, there's, I think powerlessness might be, I, I just, I'm struggling with this because I really want to do, you know, I want everyone to, to give everyone the benefit of the doubt and that they're understanding what these narratives are about and what they're discussing and what they're hoping to get the audience to begin to think about to try and pull them out of the proverbial uh, Plato's cave. I, I want to believe that people are understanding that, but then I look around me at the world, at the material conditions of the world and people's engagement with them. And, and I mean, like I said, we live in a world where people are still having discussions of whether or not they should um, get a vaccine to make the world safer for each other. Like, I, like this is where we live. So then I'm like, I just, I don't 
I don't think they get it. I don't think they understand. The ultimate kind of like proverbial, the ultimate mic drop here is the idea like everyone knows that capitalism and the way we live our lives under capitalism is literally destroying like what we what we call home, right? We know that. We know that be, it's irrefutable at this point in time. We are not willing to stop. And I don't think it's because we... I don't think it's because we know we're powerless. I think we're scared of that power. I think we're scared of change. I think we're scared of a little bit of discomfort. I think those all factor in. So when we look, when we watch a film, coming back to the film itself or series, I should say, um, like Squid Game, I mean, it's there, but it's not like, I don't know what I can do about it. Um, maybe I'm not even sure I'm understanding it. No, it's, I, I don't want to change. I don't want to change. I'm scared of it. What do you think? Is it fear? Yeah. I mean, I think that definitely has to be part of it. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, we don't even, it's, this isn't even a guess, right? We know that anti-capitalist sentiment among certain age groups is like the highest that it's ever been. Right. So we know that at least those people see through the veil, right? Like they, they, they are aware uh, that capitalism is everything you just said, right? Either they're afraid of their power and of change, or they feel powerless, so don't take any action, or they actually are taking action and it's just not having the effect that we see at a rapid enough scale, right, for us to be aware of it. I, I think that I would guess that it's probably they don't want to change. Right. I mean, I'm guilty of that. I don't want to change beyond, you know, the changes that I make on a daily basis. I don't want to wholesale change my life overnight. Like, I don't want to do that. I am part of the problem. I watch Squid Game and it didn't change the way that I behave at all, you know. So, I yeah, I mean, that. and do we tie that now to the notion that we have another episode on called Narcotizing Dysfunction? Is this just another another bit of data or information being funneled into our brain and merely the consumption of this film makes us feel like, Oh, I'm in the know. Well, that's enough. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I have so much information that like I have made change, right? I, yeah. We confuse action for information, right? Or information for action, I guess, to put right. it the better way. So I watched the film. I know it's anti-capitalist. I was entertained and I fully get the narrative. And like, yeah, my work here is done, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's possible. I actually don't understand why the concept of narcotizing dysfunction doesn't get more credibility and isn't more well-known, but Yeah. It is what yeah. it is. Okay, so... I mean, but maybe that's the point, that there's just so much anti-capitalist narrative right now that no one's even really challenging capitalism that much anymore because we're just all so informed about it, we know about it, and so we've just substituted that information for real action. I don't know. Maybe that's possible. Right. So we spent a lot of time talking around Squid Game and mm -hmm. around, like, where it might be situated in the pop culture zeitgeist um, on a, in, as a global phenomenon that that's clearly resonating with people for one reason or another. Maybe it's the violence. Maybe it is the anti-capitalist critique. Maybe it is the releasing of frustration within the system for a lot of people. We also are, we have echoed our um, hesitation to say that it actually means anything. Like I get, we, yes, we, we don't think anything is going to come of this. Cool. It's popular. Um, cool. It is actually a very good critique. We act, like, we're not crapping on it. It is good. Um, it is a good critique. Uh, I, I would argue there's actually been maybe better critiques, but it's good. It's pretty good. Um, are there any specific parts that you want to draw out that might have gone over anyone's head that was filming it? Like within, or filming it, excuse me, viewing it. Anyone that was viewing it, are there specific parts? Because I, I, again, I, I won't pretend to have watched every other um, of the probably thousands of other uh, critiques or um Ex explanations of the show that exist, but uh, for our audience, are, I mean, I can't even spit out what I'm trying to say here. This is ludicrous. Are there any specific parts of these nine episodes that you think might have flown over everyone's head that you want to like, like pull out? 
I mean, the one that really stuck out for me that made me think the most really like analyze myself as I was watching it was the VIPs, right? Like the game makers who, if you haven't seen it, they're like the collection of, I think they're all white and males. There was and... one that was speaking Mandarin for a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like the acting was just so over the top. That at first I was like laughing, right? Like this is ridiculous. But then I realized like clearly it's very intentional that these people are just so outrageous and like perverse and grotesque that like it just disgusts you, right? That, I mean, they are the capitalists being depicted in the film. And a lot of, I've read some critiques where people were saying their theories were that they represent the viewers of the series, that we are watching Squid Game in the comfort of our homes and like we are the ultra wealthy. But I don't know, man. It's hard for me not to believe that that's not a critique of Westerners, that they represent Westerners. Just like so loud, so outrageous, so just blatant consumption that their lifestyle and their entertainment is very clearly cost the lives of other people not just the people in the game, but like so dehumanizing, like the women laying on the couch painted as animals, literally human furniture, like the coffee table is a person, you know, et cetera. Like I get that it's a critique of like capitalists, but like I feel like it's got to be a critique of the West as well. Like that's got to be in there. Okay. Um, While this one's like really on the nose in terms of the games themselves, I think one of the things that we're supposed to get across through the playing of these six games is that one of the only reasons that capitalism succeeds or prevails as the hegemonic ideology um, and, of course, associated material practices to this day is because it is so good at getting us to fight and compete with each other. That's what the games are about, Mm -hmm. right? That's the metaphor there. However, doubling down on it, I think the most interesting part of that competition isn't like people pushing each other off the bridge or, or whatever transpired with the lying in the marble game. Um, I think the most interesting part was the first night of riots that, that Mm -hmm. riot. how, if we think about the, um, the, the pyramid that we all live in, most of the pyramid, like the foundation of the pyramid is labor and how do, do those in power, i.e. leadership, storytellers and enforcers, um, maintain their authority in a society it, at some point, people are going to question enforcement. At some point, people are going to question, um, obviously corrupt mythological narratives of foundation and those types of things. But one thing that they can always count on is that us, the masses, the unwashed masses will continue to fight each other in the system. And that t- accounts for, I don't even know at this point, I don't, I, I don't want to make up a percentage, but the vast majority of maintaining the order of the pyramid is us fighting each other. That's, that's mm-hmm. the part that most people can count on, right? Doesn't matter how we divide ourselves in a capitalist system. We divide ourselves. And we've talked about this on numerous different episodes. And, 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 and what are your thoughts as the riot being part of that process? Oh, yeah, I 100 percent agree. Like it's the the labor, you know, fracturing itself. I mean, in this case, literally killing each other. They I think it's interesting because many people have talked about how the game itself is like. A really disgusting representation of equality, because within the game, there are very strict rules that apply even to everyone. Right. So everyone is equal under the rules of the game, even though the outcome clearly is death, which is a problem. But this is the riot is, you know, an extra activity that happens outside of the game that is purely controlled by the game makers themselves. Right. They're the ones that allow it to happen. They're the ones that eventually put a stop to it. They're the ones that control this, you know, release of aggression and frustration and violence. by the participants at this point. And so it's like, you know, everyone wants capitalism. They think ideally it's a meritocracy, right? Like everyone, you work hard and you work your way up and the people that are the most qualified and the most, you know, hardworking, they're the ones that rise to the top. And, but we all know that's not how it works, right? That the people in charge, the people in power can do all kinds of things to completely diminish and destroy the meritocracy at least the aspects of meritocracy that might exist in the system overall. In this case, I think that's perfectly represented by the riot. The game makers let this happen outside of the game. It's outside of the rules of the game. It completely removes the equality that they have guaranteed to all the participants. 
they let it start and they let it finish as they wish. You know, it's it's according to whatever they desire. And then they put a stop to it when they're done being entertained, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and picking and choosing who gets to do what activity, right? Like we can even see this, and this is clearly a critique. I don't know what the critique might be. The corollary might be in South Korea, but if we are making this correlation in the States, we can see that how certain groups, um, are able to be violent and do criminal things with very little surveillance and others are not. We can definitely see this over the last couple of years, how white nationalists are not receiving the same general critique or surveillance of police in comparison um, to Black Lives Matter or Antifa or whatever, right? Like it's it's not even remotely equitable in, in that distribution mm-hmm. of surveillance, right? That's an example right there. We're choosing mm-hmm. sides. And in this case, the state is choosing sides. Yep. That's what I kind of picked up on. Yeah, right, very next. clearly, like the game makers are, because it was the one gang, right, that the game makers saw what was about to happen and let it happen. So they gave that gang, I mean, then everyone participates that because they had to, but they gave into like what they were going to do. They could have very easily stopped it before it happened because they knew it was going to, but they didn't, right? They let it continue. Right. Okay. Ne- next question that I thought of. All right. The enforcing class, right? The Mm -hmm. ranked enforcing class. There's three ranks. There's square, there's triangle, there's circle. The enforcers. A couple of the enforcers um, eventually find their own way to game the system, not unlike might happen in a real life society where police eventually also find themselves in their own like mm, subversive capitalist ventures, whatever, usually in, 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 in narcotics, right? Like I think that's what was meant to be the corollary. But I don't even want to talk about that. That's not even that interesting to me. It was probably the least interesting part of the story, if I'm honest with you. I want to talk about the enforcers themselves and what keeps them so docile and engaged in the system. Um, what do you think Squid Game shows us about the enforcing class? Mm-hmm. There's, I read some theories on this of like, are they getting paid, right? Like where were they potentially past participants? Like, why would you be doing this? One of the theories was that, you know, in the beginning, the main character plays the game in the subway and he chooses between the red or blue folded up, like, uh, I guess, red or green folded up pieces of paper. One of the fan theories is like, had he chose the red one, then he would have been recruited to be a guard instead of a participant because the uniform oh. colors, which I think like I could see. Um But yeah, the question is how, why don't they fight against the game or each other? Or why don't they kill the, you know, the game masters? Or, I mean, they're all armed. They could easily rise up. So how are they kept so docile? They're treated poorly. Yeah. The only explanation could be that they're being paid or that the game makers have something, you know, above them that makes them stay in line. I don't know. I don't know what it is. We don't see that. But we transfer that over to like the real world, the enforcement class, at least for internal, you know what, and external enforcers is celebrated rhetorically, right? Mm -hmm. Like supporting troops and whatnot, or like, you know, whatever, uh, all of the the copaganda, which we'll get to in later, like, like they celebrated Mm -hmm. that way, but it's not, but it's not actually supported materially in the same way um there as it may have been in the past right like like Mm -hmm. even the enforcing classes in ancient societies they were well compensated with like whatever acquisitions of 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 land and treasures and so on and so forth whatever treasures like they're pirates but you get what i'm saying (laughs) whereas now the enforcing classes are at least not very well materially supported by any stretch Mm -hmm. of the imagination and yet they're still willing to work for the dominant power why I guess is what I like. So even I mean, and the guards like in the squid game, potentially it's the same thing, right? It maybe doesn't have to be a lot of money. They just found people who were poor, who were willing to do that job, right? They found them on the subway, just like they found all the game participants. Hey, we know you're in debt. We'll pay you whatever, a hundred thousand dollars to do this. And they'd be willing to kill people. That's totally possible. Right. And I think that could happen in the real world also, you know, I mean, it does. Okay. One more, well, there's two more that I want to get to. Deception. So the most heartbreaking episode, again, we're spoiling this. We we warned you at the beginning, um, is is six, where um, it's the marble game. And a couple of, uh, what, three, three of the main characters, well, two and a half, if you watch the whole thing through, but but three of the main characters, (laughs) three of the main characters that you've kind of grown attached to um, end up dying. Um, all, uh, due to some pretty heartbreaking circumstances. One of which though is based on deception. So even in this now very close relationship that's been developed between our main character, uh, Gyun 
Um, I can't pronounce, mm-hmm. excuse my Korean, uh, whatever. And um, I don't even know that I remember. I will just call him player number one, the first guy, player number mm-hmm. one. They've developed this very tight relationship. He's an old man. Um, he's sick. Uh, and, and, and the other, the other main characters have kind of like helped pull him through uh, a couple of the games. Some of his ideas have actually also helped pull them through a couple of the games, like in tug of war, even though he wasn't strong, he was able to come up with a strategy that helped them out. Long story short, this relationship has been cultivated for six episodes. So six hours of, of, of building this relationship and your heart breaks because the Marvel game is about basically honesty and, and, and these two people are close and eventually again starts lying to player four fifty six starts lying to player one, basically dooming player one to death. Um, Mm -hmm. and then at the end player one reveals, he knew he was being lied to as he's about to get executed. What are you like? Is that, does, is there any meaning there or is that just something that's supposed to draw us as an audience in just a heartbreaking story? But, but is there also like, I guess a capitalist, subversive meaning there well i thought that's funny because i didn't even think you were going to that relationship because the other one is deception too when he puts the rocks in the guy's thing and he thinks he has i want to get to that one too because that's that's the worst part for me my favorite character this is super predictable everyone knows my favorite character is going to be ali um but right yeah (laughs) so it's hard to it's hard to comment on the other one. The first one you mentioned with player 456 and player one, you know, Gi Hyun and I think Il Nam is the other. The yeah, player Il Nam, one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, because we later find out that, you know, player one was, is the orchestrator of the games and he's been playing them for the experience, but he's the one that's in charge of the whole thing. So it really didn't actually cost him anything to be lied to and then to reveal the lie. He doesn't actually get executed. But we think that he does until a couple episodes later. Um, So we think it's like the ultimate self-sacrifice and being selfless. But in real life, he's using it as his chance to exit the game. So it's hard to comment on that one because we know in the end... It wasn't like this great selfless. But why athlete. before fifty six doesn't know that? Why? Right. How is he? I mean, what is this, his rationalization of these lies? What does that say about capitalism? So he's going to rationalize it in a couple of ways. It's either me or him, right? That's the obvious mm-hmm. one. I need to do what I need to do to survive. And secondly, I feel a little bit less guilty because I'm working under the auspices that he has a tumor and he's not going to make it that much longer, right? He's an old yep. man. No, I think that's but exactly still, right. I think, yeah. I mean, is there anything there that the the writers are hoping adds just another layer of criticism of capitalism? Or am I? Oh, really yeah, I mean, probably for sure. The way that we treat our elders and take care of the sick and, you know, the ways that capitalists are willing to, you know, lie, cheat and steal to, I mean, the way that the system requires lying, cheating and stealing to gain an advantage, Right. And being willing to take advantage of people that are, you know, less able or whatever. There's a whole commentary there, I think, for sure. Okay, second part of deception. Let's get to the one that you were thinking of. Um, Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, the character of Ali. First and foremost, there's Mm -hmm. a critique regarding immigration for sure 100 um, this yeah. would be the south korean version of it in which uh, uh a man from pakistan is is basically in south korea um learns the language and is 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 an immigrant i don't know that it's ever fleshed out whether he's quote-unquote legal or illegal which is entirely mm-hmm. disgusting description to, to describe humans as but we'll get to that maybe in another episode um on on immigration but he's there. And this is him in South Korea, just trying to essentially make a living. He's given this opportunity to perhaps help his family back home. Let's start with that. What is What are our writers trying to say about um, immigration and the migration of people because they need to find more extreme ways to create capital for themselves what 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 i mean is that i mean i guess i don't even know what they're trying to explain merely having the character of ali is expressing right. that right no 100 percent. yeah i mean his whole character arc is like you said talking about issues with immigration created by capitalism right i mean and this, the fact that it's pakistan specifically is a narrative on you know global politics and how Wow, why would he want to, you know, immigrate to South Korea? Well, because the situation in Pakistan is outrageous and ridiculous as a result of Western powers meddling, you know, clearly. 
So well, I think and it's again, even a higher level commentary on global politics and military and et cetera, for sure. Right. And and and, and specifically for those that don't know, like it, the, the Pakistani immigration is not just to South Korea. It's 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 a global phenomenon at this point for people that are seeking opportunity. Uh, you know, a lot of immigration to places like Nepal and Tibet to to help people climb K two and what like Pakistani immigration is a problem because of like the economic pressures that are in the country. So I think that's part of mm-hmm. it there. That said, okay, then we already know how it's framed. At some point, Ali over and over again is um, somewhat accosted by not the main players as much, but other players for being a foreigner and not being whatever, not having his papers or things along those lines. That's to be expected. That was predictable. What about the painting of him of only having certain traits, but not others, mostly having physical traits and not cognitive traits? Do you think there is something there to that? Oh, hundred percent. Like, I mean, the, you know, the idea that immigrants take, you know, manual labor jobs, et cetera, they can't possibly be smart also like that would be ridiculous. They're strong bodies that, you know, you can put them into the cogs of the machine and they will function for sure. I mean, that's how he's portrayed. Right. Never mind that they're, the, they're, they're, they're smart enough to be able to speak two, three, four languages, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah, yeah. So anyway, okay. So there's I mean, even that. His, I, finally, just, I just remember this too. His job was in a factory, right? He goes back there to right. try to get paid yeah. and et cetera. Yeah. Um, okay. And then finally with like the Ali character arc, he creates this like nice relationship with the second main character. I forget what number he is. Um, what's his name though? He's Song, number 218, Songs. just so you know, but uh, Song Wu. Okay. Okay. This relationship is looking good and, and, and they have kind of a friendship. So- Song Wu is going to be the quote unquote brains and Ali will be the strength of this relationship as they get through the game together until we get to the marble game when Song Wu, to be blunt, tricks Ali and Ali ends up executed. Um, again, it's a spoiler. So you, I'm assuming everyone's already watched it if you're this far into the episode. Um what are your thoughts? Why this? Why this deception? How do we rationalize this deception in capitalism? What are the, we know what the writers are doing. Why are the writers making us consider this? I mean, it's the idea that when things get further along, right? Like when all the chips are on the table, people in the capitalist system will go to all lengths to I mean, discredit, delegitimize, get ahead of, et cetera, immigrants. I mean, I think that's the commentary that there are all kind of, you know, extra capitalist systems and mechanisms which exist that function to do those very things. Right. And and, yeah. Because, I mean, you have to know as, as, as as a viewer, the minute Ali was introduced, you knew he was not going to win. Like, like right. as a, as a viewer, you knew it's almost like what the, the trope here in us films, the minute a character of color is introduced into a horror or action film, you already know they will be among the first to die, if not be first to right. die. And that's the way it worked for the seventies, eighties, nineties, two thousands. I think now some films are trying to like flip that fine. Great. But like you, you knew the minute Ali was introduced, that was it for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they did that intentionally. I don't think this was them actually falling into that trope. I think they, no, that, yeah. that was an intentional 100%. decision by the writers. Yeah. Okay. Final question that I have um, that I've been thinking about and ruminating on since I watched it. So the final episode, it's revealed that player one was not really, I mean, he really was an old man and he really did have a tumor, but he was not really a player. He was the orchestrator of this. And... I guess what I want to ask is there are some pieces of dialogue that I don't remember verbatim, but towards the end of how the poor are limited in options because they lack the capital, but the wealthy are limited in options because they lack, they've accomplished everything. They have nothing else to do. And so there is this false equivalency created by the old man in this last dialogue with player 456, right? He comes and visits Mm -hmm. him. What? It's a whole year later. He comes and finds him. Fine. What what is that supposed to mean? I actually hated that. I absolutely hated that part. It was a and I don't know if the writers did that intentionally. I don't know what they were thinking, but there was this. I don't even know that 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 part of the. I don't even think that needed to be done. I think the show was over when um when the game was over. I don't know that we needed a year later. Actually, to be honest, I mean it was kind of cool to see. I guess the the, the kid get adopted um and uh, and and him give some money to his friend's mom. I mean those were all nice 
parts of the I story. I remember how to tie it to loose ends, right? For sure. But that was not a loose end. That wasn't a loose end at all. This, I, I think they maybe it was a big reveal that the old man was secretly running the show. Cool. But the commentary, okay, the false equivalency. I'm good. I'm, no, I'm, but I, I think that they're depicting the fact, like how outrageous that is, that the writers aren't making that a false equivalency, making that equivalency by having him say that. They're demonstrating how ridiculous he is that he thinks that that is the equivalent. That, like me and my friends are so bored that this is what we're doing to stay entertained, just like everyone that's poor, you know, trying to create this equivalency that clearly isn't there. Nine episodes, literally nine episodes, almost making the audience attempt to fall in love with this old man because he is the most lovable character, right? Uh, the easy. Weird, I mean, that's the character. shock is the reveal that he's actually the ultimate villain. You know what I mean? Which I think that's actually, if there's one critique that I have of the series is I don't think they did that enough at the end. That's my point. End, I, think, I think you still yeah. like him. I think you still feel mm-hmm. bad for him. You still love yeah. him as he's dying, right? I think that's... Yeah. I think that they, like, he clearly is the biggest villain of the entire show. Um, but he's not made out to be that. And, you know, maybe that's part of the critique is that, you know, we don't villainize the billionaires. We villainize the politicians and we villainize, you know, the presidents and we villainize the middle tier of people that we view as elite, but the billionaires basically skirt by without any real critique whatsoever. Like, yeah, clearly people are critiquing the Musks and the Bezos and the whatever, but for the most part, our daily discourse isn't talking about those people. It's talking about, you know, what's Biden doing and what did Trump tweet last? And like, you know, what is Boris Johnson doing? And like that, that's what the, the, the main discourse is that we have on a daily basis. It's, you know, the guy dressed in all black, that's basically the controller of the game. You know, that's the person that we talk about all the time. And that's what part of the series is about, but it's really the billionaires that are pulling the strings. And so maybe that's kind of the message in the series is that, you know, he should be the villain. He should, him and the other game makers, the VIPs, they're the ones that should be the villains of the series, but that's not how it is portrayed. At least in Il Nam's case, like you said, at the end, he's still like, we still, he's still a lovable character, right? He dies. He tells the truth in the end and reveals, you know, what had been going on and explains the game. Although I think it's interesting that even to his last breath, he will only tell the truth if, you know, player 456 wins the other little mini game. If you remember, they bet on the homeless yeah, person they, on the, yeah. the street, or the alcoholic on the street in the winter, whether or not someone will come save him, right? They have a bet and he loses, right? Although I guess he dies in theory before he sees that he's lost, but he, he still is playing games. He still just wants to be entertained at the expense of everyone everyone in the scene, right? He could have clearly just called help for that guy on his own, but he didn't. He wanted to be entertained until the very end. You know, he's playing okay. with people. Good. I also wanted to talk about the cop and his brother, but I don't think I actually want to anymore. It's not even that interesting a part of the story. I think it's more of like the idea of copaganda, that there is a police mm-hmm. officer that exists in the world and we should rely on the police to help come save us, <laughs> although he doesn't find cool. I mean, he tries, um, yeah. Yeah, and the brother on brother violence is kind of interesting at the end. That maybe that's mm-hmm. a, 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 that 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 could go back to the idea of even even Marx in this case, who wrote about this in the manifesto that capitalism has has um, tainted relationships so much that that fam- familial relations. I'm not going to be able to quote directly the Communist Manifesto are merely like monetary exchanges at this point. I think mm-hmm. that there was some commentary there, but I want to get back to this idea at the end. So if we as we kind of wind down here. Is the episode over or was um, uh, 456 running off the airplane where he's supposed to be going? This was frustrating. You just want to go him to go see his kid. You just want him to go see the kid at this mm-hmm. point. Go see your daughter. This is what this has all been about in theory. And then he leaves the plane when he gets the phone call or makes the phone call. He leaves the plane and he's going back to the game. Mm-hmm. My question to you is, do you think this is previewing a second season, which would be absolute agony? And I probably would not watch it um, because the show is over in my head. Like just shows need to know when to end. They never do. Or is this merely a commentary on how even when you beat the game, you're so addicted to the game that you're going to go back to it anyway? So I actually have exactly what the uh, writer, director, producer had in mind when he wrote this. I have a quote. Okay, I've not viewed anything. I looked this up too. So I'll just read it instead of trying to make it up myself. He says... It's true that season one ended in an open-ended way, but I actually thought that this could be good closure for the whole story too. Season one ends with Gi-hyun turning back and not getting on the plane to the States. And that was, in fact, my way of communicating the message 
that you should not be dragged along by the competitive flow of society, that you should start thinking about who has created the whole system and whether there is some potential for you to turn back and face it. So it's not necessarily Gi Hyun turning back to get revenge. It could actually be interpreted as him making a very on the spot eye contact with what is truly going on in the bigger picture. So I thought that might be a good, simple, but ambiguous way to end the story for Gi Hyun. So he's basically saying, because he's on the phone, right, with essentially the game makers, and they're saying, you know, get on the plane or it's going to go bad for you. So the writer is saying, if he was going to do what the system wanted him to do, he would get on the plane. But by turning around in the uh, walkway, he's actually going against the grain and going against what the system like wants him to do. He's actually challenging the system by doing that. So is capitalism then going to win in the meta sense here? And are we going to get a second season, even though we absolutely do not need one? I have to what assume. Think? What, do you, so, what do you think? Yeah, I have to assume that there's going to be a second season. But I, I, I mean, from the capitalist perspective, Netflix would be dumb not to do it because they're going to make so much money. You know what I mean? But yeah. it's going to taint the story so badly. Yeah. I mean, the, we'll see it's gonna what make it they worse. can do. Yeah. In my opinion, it should be purely like vengeance where this is my, this is what I think it should be. If I could write screenplays, I would write this pilot. I think it should be the young, the son of the uh, woman, I forgot, or not, she's not the son, the little brother of the woman. Yeah. I think it should be like years later and he's been basically training his entire life and he goes back and plays in the game and just gets vengeance against everyone. He wins the games and et cetera, but through this process, like secretly just slaughters every single person. That's what it should be. But that could be like one episode. I think it needs to be over. I think some, at some point people need to stop. And I, and I think that is the, the meta commentary here is Netflix won't stop. Honestly, mm-hmm. love the writers to death. Probably they made a good show, but they're not going to want to stop. They're going to want to keep paid. And that's like, that's the commentary in and of itself. Netflix has already revealed its cards. I think if you watch enough Netflix, unfortunately, which during COVID I've watched more than I'm willing to admit, but um, the ones that are, have an ending arc, say limited series, the ones that don't say, um, they say season one. And I believe mm-hmm. this one, when you watch it, says season one or first season. Although I will say the writer himself has not, he said that he has no idea if there's going to be a season two or not. He doesn't know. But you're right. That would be the ultimate flex if he was like, nope, I did it and I'm done. I'm not going to write another one. Yeah, if that's he did what I'm other projects for. like for Netflix and films and whatever, like maybe he got a contract but didn't do Squid Game season two. That would be pretty dope. Like refused to do it. Even a show that in some ways I thought was actually a little bit better in some of its commentary, even though it was less more metaphorical and more on the nose, Casa de Papel. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would even argue, and that's a show I really enjoy, it it, it should have been done. Uh, oh, yeah, it's dragging least. on. And they split the last season up into too many seasons. And like, yeah, it's just like, like, yeah, like, 100%. Like the first heist and the completion, the arc on that first heist being complete, that was it. You were done. That was it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah. But I mean, Clean. yeah, ca- that's... You know, capitalism will eat me, right? out so. every single dollar that it can out of these properties. That's what it does. You know what I mean? So, in but in- we are the problem because we will watch. Stay it. tuned. Yeah, we yeah, watch. We'll watch it. I'm still waiting for the second half of the last season to come out. I will watch it. Right. You know? Okay. So, all right, let's kind of wrap this up into a neat little bow, and, and not everything we talked about regarding specific examples. We just went through those. But like, do you have concluding thoughts? Do, is this thing? what it's supposed to be is squid game. I guess I shouldn't ask that question. It is what it is supposed to be. It is a critique of capitalism. Is this critique of capitalism going to have any actual effect on, on the hegemony? I don't know how to answer that because it's like, you know, is it going to bring, is this series going to bring about the fall of capitalism in the next 12 months? Like very clearly not. Right. Is it going to plant the seed for people someday to like, who knows? Right. I, I don't know how to, but, but that's the point. Like, like we, we listed off all of the prior films that are in this spirit and some of them are at this point. I mean, office space, 1999, what is that? Is 22 years old. Right. Like, I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I even brought up Apocalypse Now. That's older than all of them. I, and I'm sure there were some in the some films in the 50s and 60s that I have no idea even existed, but were probably popular then and were critiquing things then. And yeah, I, I don't mean, know. The, the answer is, I guess I reject the premise of your question if I'm going to answer for real and that okay. like, we are the ones that are wrong if we think that any art form is going to 
genuinely produce an actual, you know, actions against capitalism. We, we are the ones that are wrong if we think that that's ever going to happen. And, you know, so kudos for these creators for making this anti-capitalist art and like, et cetera, but it's just art. You know what I mean? So then we're in a perpetual state of awareness building. We produce the art, the art makes us aware, and then it is on us. It is our responsibility as the viewer of the art or listener to the art to then take that art, interpret it, and perform our own actions, gain agency from that. Unfortunately, the art is constantly being produced and pumped into our heads. So rather than gaining agency, I am more compelled now to go view the next piece of art, and we have this vicious cycle. So the art that you know, like. That's such a fundamental, right now we're doing like such a basic analysis, right? Like maybe the most anti-capitalist thing that you can do is create art that makes someone feel something. Like literally we are so just engrossed all of the time in just absolute just work and just inundating ourselves with things that like you have succeeded as an artist if you can make people just pause and feel some emotion, right? And I'm thinking of like, Boots Riley and Sorry to Bother You. Was that the best film that was ever made? Absolutely not. Was it unique? 100%. Did it make people stop and actually feel, emote, and like think of things in a different way? 100%. And so in my opinion, like that film as an anti-capitalist critique is 100% a success because anyone that watched that film thought of something that they had never seen before that was, you know, aesthetically pleasing and unique, that was a critique on capitalism that made you feel a certain way while you were watching it. So, you know, like, I think that the best thing that any artist could do is just make someone feel something, you know, I mean, that's the best anti-capitalist thing you could probably do right now is make someone that's consuming your art, feel something that's outside the scope of, you know, just the, the Melba toast of capitalist society, I think. That's a good, that's a good thought to go out on. Take us there. All right. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later. Hey, everyone. This is Nick. If you enjoyed that episode, be sure to like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And if you really like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash revolution and ideology. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our Patreon supporters.